the human brain, despite all our scientific breakthroughs, there is still much we don't know about how our brains function or why at times they have trouble functioning. This week, new and innovative approaches to harnessing the power of the human brain. I'm Mike Walter in Los Angeles. Let's take it full frame. <laughs> His foray into the culinary world began as a young boy, cooking at his mother's side in his Austrian hometown where she was a chef. Today, Wolfgang Puck is one of the most recognized and prominent celebrity chefs in the world. The Puck brand is everywhere. He owns and operates more than 20 fine dining restaurants, caters some of Hollywood's biggest events, and designs and develops wildly popular kitchen and food products. He is credited for introducing the fusion cooking concept to the world. In 2013, this renowned chef was inducted into the Culinary Hall of Fame. Despite his demanding schedule, Wolfgang Puck is actively involved in many philanthropic and charitable endeavors, including his own work and his own charitable foundation. The search for a cure to Alzheimer's disease is a cause that's very close to his heart. Wolfgang Puck has devoted himself to supporting the efforts of the Cleveland Clinic at the Lou Ruvo Center for Brain Health catering their annual star-studded fundraising gala and donating profits from his Wolfgang Puck wine label to the center. Wolfgang Puck, welcome to the broadcast. Great to have you here. Thank you. My pleasure to be here. Um, when it comes to celebrity chefs, I've heard you described as the patron saint of celebrity chefs. Bobby Flay even said, because of you, he has his career. What, is it, what does it feel like to be this iconic person out there? And how much time do you get to actually do what you like in the kitchen other than just creating this brand? You know, first of all, I think this celebrity chef name, in a way, it's a funny name to me because I'm a chef, I'm a cook, that's what I love to do. And I still love to create. Every day when I'm at a restaurant, I might not be in the kitchen on one station and just making uh, noodles or just making pizzas or grill the meat or steam the fish or so on. I really invent and cook in my head all the time. So I might go like uh, to Spago and said, okay, you know what, I think we can make our duck a little bit better. I had an idea. So then we have, I bring a guy, he works with me on the duck, and then we do it. And what I'm doing now, what we are building now, is an experimental kitchen. So that way we can uh, use all new technologies. There are so many new technical advances now in cooking equipment, which we can incorporate in our kitchen. So I'm always involved thinking about cooking. You know, it's interesting growing up, I can remember my mom watching Julia Child and she'd say, Coco Bond, throw in more wine and all of that yeah. sort of thing. Whoa, wine. Good, and good, I, good imitation. <laughs> and I remember my mom kind of jotting it down. We yeah. didn't have the Google back then. Yeah. And then about midway through, she'd just throw her hands up and say, forget it. But now it's like, it seems like you can watch a cooking show 24 seven. Are you surprised at, at how much the explosion of all of this? You know, it is amazing. When I remember how the Food Network started, you know, like, 15 years ago, they had a little office with a little electric burner, and that was it. And then, like, they bought Iron Chef, the first big cooking competition, chef's competition. And then that grew on now from Bravo to all these channels. They all have cooking competitions. I mean, it's like the whole world. Everybody is a cook. Everybody has a competition. I remember a few weeks ago, I judged a competition with kids. You know, we were like 12-year-old. And one boy, he made me a sandwich with pulled pork. And I said, how did you cook the, pu the pulled pork in one hour? You know, because it takes like three hours. He looked at me and said, in the, in the pressure cooker. <laughs> I mean, it's like it was something completely normal, you know. The, but what is great, people are more interested now in what they put in their body. You know, America lagged so far behind Asia, Europe in food, in people enjoying food, in eating great food. It was always fast food, the fast type, big hamburger, a hot dog, and stuff like that. Now people are into food. 30 years ago, forget it. I remember when I put goat cheese on a pizza. People said, goat cheese on a pizza? <laughs> Sun-dried tomato was something totally new. So we have changed for the better in the food industry, in restaurants for sure. At that time, there were so few American chefs. Now, everybody is a chef almost. I mean, the Food Network and all these television shows, everybody wants to be on TV. So we have great young American chefs now 
great restaurants all over the country, whereas 30 years ago, it was boring, basically. Yeah, but you know, take me back in time. You're, you're at your mother's side, you're learning in the kitchen. Could you have ever imagined you'd be sitting here and talking about this, that you'd be at this stage? I mean, you must have had dreams and ambitions as a, as a young kid, but I mean, you probably never could have foreseen how things have gone. Uh, not exactly, especially the way it started out. You know, it started out on a sad note. My stepfather, my mother was an angel, and she was a chef in the summertime. In the winter, she spent the time at home. But my stepfather was very, very crazy, and he always told me, as a kid, 13, 14 years old, 12 years old, he always told me I'm good for nothing. So then finally, I wanted to leave my house because I couldn't stand him anymore. Then I moved from my house 50 miles away to a small town, uh, and to start an apprenticeship there in uh, this hotel called uh, Post Hotel. Over there, so I start to work peeling potatoes, washing spinach, slicing onions, and all this work, cleaning the oven, cleaning the kitchen, and all that stuff. And uh, one Sunday, like one month into my apprenticeship, we ran out of potatoes. There were no more uh, potatoes, steamed potatoes. There were no more mashed potatoes left. And the chef comes up for me and told me I'm good for nothing. You know, I have to be go back home. And I said, you know, I cannot get, go back home. So that was probably my lowest day of my life. So I stood there on a bridge. Uh, there was a big river going through this thing, and I said, I'm going to jump into the river because my father told me I'm good for nothing. The chef told me I'm good for nothing. So I was 14 years old. And then after an hour deciding should I jump or not, finally I said, you know what, I'm going to go back home and then go back to the restaurant. Maybe the chef was drunk and he forgot about it. So sure enough, I come back the next morning, and the apprentice who was ahead of me said, OK, you can go down in the vegetable cellar. He was all excited I was back, so he didn't have to peel potatoes. <laughs> and then two weeks later, the chef came down. They brought me sandwiches down and everything. I basically lived in the cellar for two weeks. And uh, the chef came down and said, what are you doing here? You're supposed to be at home. You're supposed to. I fired you. And I said, I cannot go home. You know, that's not an option for me. And then he called the owner of the hotel, and the owner of the hotel came and said, you know what, if he is that determined, maybe I'm just going to try him out in the other hotel. They all owned another hotel. They sent me to the other hotel, and there they had a woman chef, too. And she had a son my age, 14 years old. And she took me a little bit under her wing, and then it started to get better. Wow, so persistence, persistence more is important, important than anything yeah. else. And I think a no is not an answer. You know, I told everybody, my kids, the chefs, I said, you know, if something goes wrong, you have to learn from it and move on. You never take, take it as a defeat. It's interesting. Do you ever think, uh, geez, I wish I had never left Europe? I mean, obviously, uh, coming here to the United States has been a windfall for you in many respects. You know, Europe is a fantastic continent with many great countries. We go on vacation there. I think I went from Austria to France, worked in some of the great restaurants like Maxime's in Paris and Beaumanier and Hotel de Paris and so forth. But to me, my dream as a child was coming to America because here everybody drove a big car, a Chevrolet or a Cadillac, and you know that was something we didn't have in Europe. And at that time, with the exchange rate, you made at least double the money in America than you made uh, in Europe. So when I worked at Maxim's and I got offered a job in uh, New York, I said, I'm going. I sold my bed and my armoire and everything, and then moved to New York. I didn't like the restaurant where I was supposed to work. It was like a bistro. And then somebody offered me a job in Indianapolis. I took the bus from New York to Indianapolis and started in Indianapolis in a restaurant called La Tour. And so that's my beginning in America. Indianapolis is the big time. Yeah, Indianapolis, <laughs> yeah. I loved auto racing. You know, they have the 500 course, miles. Yeah. And uh, you hear about that all the time. And then in Monaco, where I lived, it's also big for the uh, Grand Prix in Monaco and so forth. So I said, oh, it must be like Monaco. So I ended up in Indianapolis in November. <laughs> and uh, it was gray and flat. Yeah. And so I, I arrived there, I don't know, Saturday, <laughs> Sunday, every restaurant was closed. You couldn't drink wine. And I was, it was a different place. And I said, oh, it's, my God. I don't know much about Indianapolis, but it's not Monaco. I know that much. It's not Monaco. <laughs> and, and it has changed now for the better. You know, yes. they really have uh, changed. The city changed a lot. But, you know, in 1974, 
there was really not much there. You're credited with the, this fusion uh -huh. uh, movement. Uh, was that by happenstance, or was it just a th thunderbolt? You're like, I'm, this is what I'm going to do, or? Well, I think a little bit of both. When I opened Spago in 1982, then we opened Spago in Tokyo in 1983. And during that time, somebody offered me a spot down in uh, Santa Monica on Main Street and said, oh, do another Spago close to the beach. And I said, you know what, this is too boring. I want to do a Chinese restaurant. And I always was interested in Asian flavors, like Korea, Chinese. We have a big Chinatown here, so I used to go on Sundays on my day off to all these restaurants. And I said, I want to do food like with that idea. Uh, but I s never learned about Chinese food. I never cooked in a walk. So when I told this guy who owned the building that I want to open a Chinese restaurant, he said, OK, I don't care what you cook. I know it's going to be good. So then I had to think, what do I going to do? I don't even know how to make fried rice. You know, I never cooked with a walk and everything. <laughs> and then uh, uh, I started to improvise and think, what can I do? So then I said, if I add garlic, ginger, scallion, and chilies, it will taste good. It did. So I marinated lamb chops with soy sauce and this stuff. And I made a lot of things with garlic, ginger, and scallions. And little by little, I worked it out that every dish was more by itself, could stand by itself, and didn't have the same flavor. But at the beginning, there was a lot of garlic, chili, and ginger, and, uh, and uh, a little pepper on it, maybe. That was it. So it took me about a year to really make that into one of the most amazing restaurants in the 80s. I mean, people still look back and then said, you know what, this was the first restaurant where a chef from the West met the East and combine it into one. And I think it's an exciting way to eat, a modern version of Chinese food. And I think people loved it. And this restaurant now, after 31 years, it's still going strong. You know, earlier you talked about your determination, the persistence being on that bridge. But the other thing, I see your face light up. Another big feature of who you are is creativity. And yet, being creative and trying something new like that, you always bump up against traditionalists who are like, what are you doing? And there was pushback when you first started, wasn't there? Oh, for sure. When I told people first, you know, if you do something different, people were so set in the mind. A steakhouse of steak and baked potatoes. A Chinese restaurant is always stir fried beef with broccoli or uh, chicken with orange or things like that. So then we made it different. So people at the beginning said, well, we never heard about that. I don't know if we're going to eat it, you know? So, but people started to get a little adventurous and said, OK, the restaurant wasn't that big. And then they started to eat. And even with Spargo, when it was new, it was the first restaurant with an open kitchen. We made pizzas totally different, like pizza with smoked salmon, with truffles, with Santa Barbara shrimps, and so on. So it was always, I always like to be creative and you do things. And I always try to find somebody to do the business part. Because for me, sitting in an office is boring. You still find time for philanthropy, though? I really think I consider myself so lucky to have come to America and be successful, have uh, a beautiful wife and four beautiful sons. So I really said from the beginning, you know, we have to, if we want the community to take care of us and come to our, our, our restaurants, we have to give something back to the community. So they, they are interested in us. So when I started Spago, we did a food and wine festival in 1982. And it was the first time where I put together six of my friends, chef, Paul Prudhomme, Alice Waters, and you name it, who were famous at that time. And we had 50 wineries. And we raised money for Meals on Wheels at that time, which uh, supports you know, food for homebound elderly people, people who were sick at home, who couldn't get any food. So we did that for many, many years. And uh, uh, we did a thing in Cleveland for the cl cancer clinic there for many, many years. And uh, one of the most important fundraisers we do now is actually in Las Vegas for the Lou Hoover Center, where uh, for brain health, which is run by the Cleveland Clinic. And we started that out at Spago in 93, where we had a little party with all the big wigs from Las Vegas, like Steve, Steve Wynn, et cetera, you know, all the big casino moguls. And uh, we said, you know, we're going to do something for Alzheimer's because uh, Larry's father had Alzheimer's. 
and my mother just started it. I didn't want to admit it that she had Alzheimer's, but you know, she used to do something, and then two hours later she said, okay, I have to go shopping, I need more milk, I need more this, and uh, my sister used to tell her, no, we just bought the milk, we just came from the store. She said, no, no, we didn't go to the store yet, so I knew there was something wrong, so, and Larry's father was already more advanced, so we started to raise money, and the first time, we raised like 250000 or $300,000, and I thought with 30 people, that was amazing. So that was really the little foundation, and then over the years, we raised more and more and more, and then we got Frank Gehry to build this beautiful uh, center in downtown Las Vegas, where it's for diagnostic, for to help patients, to help families, and so on, and not only just for Alzheimer's, but for ALS and for MS and all these different brain diseases for brain health, really. And I think uh, the last few years we raised 12 million. One year we raised 22 million. I mean, we raised like 160 million dollars to build that. We got grants from the government, so it's really an amazing thing because when you have a disease like that, I mean, not only the person is affected, but the whole family and friends all around them. It, well, that's the, that's a key feature because people who've never gone through that experience, they, they call it this long journey. Um, to see your mom, who was so vibrant and had such an impact on you, yeah. to sit there and, and watch that must have been extraordinarily difficult. I know. It was very, very difficult to see that because I didn't want to admit it. I said, no, no, it's not Alzheimer's. Maybe she just, uh, she didn't drink either, so I couldn't say maybe she had a, a glass of wine to match or a, a little sip of cognac or anything. So it was very difficult. And then... Uh, as she started really to progress, and I look back now in the pictures where she used to just stare away and like in a different world. And I saw so many people here in Hollywood, like, uh, uh, you know, big actors or whatsoever. Uh, I forgot his name now, who was in Ben Hur. What was his name? Oh, uh, somebody here. Charlton Heston. Charlton Heston, yes. yeah, exactly. <laughs> you put me on the spot too, I can I know, remember. I know, but I know. Yes, all of a, a sudden you'll see what an iconic actor Charlton he was. Heston. Yeah. Charlton Heston used to come to the restaurant with his wife. I used to play tennis at his tennis court. And, uh, you know, he used to sit in a wheelchair and he'd uh, star straight ahead. That year, you know, years before, he was this vibrant, strong guy. And my mother was so active in the kitchen and held the whole family together in spite of what my stepfather did. And, you know, kids all grew up really well worked really hard and you know to see somebody go that way it's really difficult it's such a cluttered landscape when you when you start looking at charitable causes and so many great causes yeah. out there um one of the things that i want to talk to you about this als um i was in a hospital room years ago watching a man struggling with als and he had almost this ouija board where he could spell out words but i mean that was all he could do yeah and that's how he communicated with his family you just watched how tragic it was and the same sort of story it wasn't just that this poor man uh dying this way but watching his family members how tough it was for them and als uh you know lou gehrig obviously yeah. brought it into the limelight but it's one of those kind of forgotten diseases. So I wanted to ask you about what's happened in this last year, this ice bucket challenge, which has been phenomenal. What do you think about that? Well, I think it's a great thing because it raises a lot of money, one thing, but also it brings more awareness to it. And that's, I think, really is an important part. Why did we have uh, uh, Frank Gehry build the building? He's one of the world great architects, but also it really brings awareness to the cause. And so people are more willing to donate money. People are more willing to, to accept what their uh, responsibilities are and so on. Before we go, the one, one thing I did want to talk to you about, China. Now, your, your footprint's going even further. Talk to us about that. Well, you know, I saw that during the economic crisis in uh, America in uh, 2009, 10, 8, or whenever it was, you know, we have six restaurants in uh, uh, Los Angeles and six in Las Vegas, and they, we were affected really tremendously. Then I decided we have to expand internationally. So we started first with Singapore, then with London, and then for years we were trying to open a restaurant in China, first in Beijing at the Waldorf Astoria, and then in Shanghai at the Waldorf Astoria, and uh, it dragged on so long. But now, uh, through a friend of mine, uh, we finally got ahead and we're going to build the first restaurant in uh, Shanghai and in two years we're going to build a restaurant in Shanghai Disney. 
Disney is building a big amusement park in Shanghai, so we're going to have the main restaurant there, and we are building a small freestanding restaurant in Shanghai also. One final question. Uh, you're stranded on a desert island. You can only bring a couple of ingredients along with you to cook your meals. What would they be? Well, I would bring uh, a magnum of Krug champagne. <laughs> Smart man. A little soy sauce and ginger <laughs> and go fishing. Hopefully I could be a good fisherman. <laughs> he is a problem solver. Thank you so much. It's Thank been a delight. You.